right, we're back. <clears throat> nervous system notes on the temporal lobe. This would be nervous system notes part 4E. Considering we've been going over the brain and breaking down into sections, you'll notice this section of the notes, or at least part 4, tends to be rather longer, have lots of subsections. But that's because the brain is a really complicated structure. So uh, without waiting very much more, let's go ahead and get into the temporal lobe. So the temporal lobes are located on each side of the brain. Basically, if you think about where your temples are located on the sides of your head, it's essentially where the temporal lobes are located. They are also deep to the temporal bones of the skull. Again, that whole clever naming system about keeping things relative is uh, just unbelievably intelligent. The lateral sulcus is one of the dividing lines from the frontal and the parietal lobes. Keep in mind the lateral sulcus runs from um, underneath the frontal lobe to underneath the parietal lobe and extends back and kind of touches the occipital lobe but runs across the entire upper edge of the actual temporal lobe. Then you also have the transverse fissure. The transverse fissure divides the temporal lobe from the cerebellum. That's going to be on the ventral, or I'm sorry, not the ventral, the bottom side of the, the inferior side of the brain, which is going to be underneath the temporal lobe but above the cerebellum. And it's the only lobe of the brain that actually comes in contact with the three other lobes. I'm not saying that the other lobes aren't interconnected between each other. I'm just simply stating that that particular lobe, the temporal lobe, actually has physical contact with each of the other ones from like a superior anatomical view. So if you're looking at... Um, the lateral view of the brain, that's where you're going to find the temporal lobes. You can slightly see them from a superior view, you can see them from a posterior view, and you can see them from an anterior view, but the best view is from a lateral view. Running through the borders real quick, you will notice that this is the lateral sulcus or the lateral fissure, and it runs across the top underneath the frontal lobe, but above the temporal, underneath the parietal, but again above the temporal. And then you have the transverse fissure, which runs above the cerebellum, which would be right here, um, and underneath the temporal lobe. And you will also notice that the temporal lobe kind of runs and is continuous with the occipital lobe. Um, I wasn't able to find whether or not there's a defining barrier, but each one of these gyri and each one of these sulcus have a specific numerical n number or name. And I'm sure there is a numerical number and name to each of these that divides it from the two, but I just wasn't able to... Uh, find that information for you. Um, most of the temporal lobe plays an integral role in the following functions. So you have hearing, of course. So hearing should be a very easy one for you to remember. Um, and the fact that hearing is processed in the temporal lobes because your ears are on the side of your head, right next to the temples, which are part of the temporal lobe is where hearing is processed. You also have smell. This is where it's processed. Do not confuse this with the location of the olfactory bulbs. The olfactory bulbs are large... Um, centers of neurons that come from the actual nasal passageway concentrate and then run a neural pathway down into the brain but then they converge on the actual temporal lobes at the smell or what is called the olfactory centers. You also have the organization and comprehension of language. This is kind of combined with two other centers. You have the auditory cortex. You also have Broca's area. We're going to throw a third one in there here in a little bit. That it's called the Wernicke's area. That the three actually work collaboratively together to actually form um, comprehensive language in terms of understanding what's coming in, but also the ability to project comprehensive language and speech coming out. And you also have a little bit of memory formation. We're not going to talk about memory formation in this particular section. We're actually going to save that for another part of, of part four, probably be part four F, but we're just going to keep rolling here. So let's talk about the actual cortical regions. This is also this, called the cerebral cortex regions of the temporal lobe. We'll just refresh it again. The cerebral cortex is the rind or orange peel of the brain that holds a lot of gray matter, which is a lot of somewheres of cell bodies, that does a tremendous amount of the processing of sensory information and a tremendous amount of signals leaving the brain for motor function. The primary or auditory cortex is the first one we're gonna talk about. It's primarily responsible for hearing and it's located in the location of action potentials, potentials received from the vestibulo cochlear nerves. Yes, that's a very complex nerve, um, nerve name, but vestibulo cochlear nerves is the pair of nerves that are called the NV. I, I, I. 
excuse me. If you're looking at the temporal lobe yet again, the primary auditory cortex is actually on the superficial end. It's this shaded area here in yellow, located right on the side of the temporal lobe, right on the lateral side of the brain. And just like any of the other primary cortexes, you also have what are called the association areas. So the auditory cortex also has the auditory association area. It's no different than the rest. What this particular section does is it's, it, res, it takes the signals in that come into the auditory cortex and actually interprets or processes them. And any sound is considered an acoustic sound and it's either speech, music, or some other sound, and it makes sense of those sounds, and then routes them to the appropriate areas where they need, for example, memory formation. Maybe it needs to be routed to the prefrontal cortex for some kind of um, prediction of future consequences, but um, the auditory association area makes sense of that and then routes it to the appropriate places. The auditory association area surrounds, if you remember correctly, this is the auditory cortex here in yellow, the auditory association area surrounds that in orange. So like anything else, one of the big things I want you to understand is the brain is a very complex structure, even though it isn't super large, but it, it's so specialized into the regions of the brain and what can occur in all those that there's all kinds of different orders that could result if there is damage to either the neural pathway leading to that cortex or to the um, actual cortex itself. One of the things I found for you guys was called auditory processing disorder. This is a disorder that affects the auditory association area and there are several different variances of it. And I have a video here, I'm gonna play a couple segments of it, the first two and a half minutes and then about a minute um, afterwards that actually kind of give you an indication of what an auditory processing disorder is. And it might actually make sense that you possibly have known somebody with this type of disorder. So Devin, welcome back to the course. Thank you. We're looking now at uh, how to identify auditory processing disorder. Can I perhaps uh, start by asking what are the symptoms? Well, the symptoms are varied, but the most common ones we find for most people with auditory processing disorder, the, the major difficulty most people have is hearing and processing uh, what they hear, particularly um, language and speech when there is any form of background noise so it really interferes with background noise really interferes with their processing ability so it's a very quiet environment one-on-one -on -one. they they do quite well but put them in a noisy classroom or say a, a party and I they have a huge kind of amount of difficulty processing what's right. heard with background noise processing disorders the woman here is talking about the fact that most people with auditory processing disorders, if there's any kind of background noise whatsoever, can't process what's actually coming into their brain. And the fact that while she's talking about it, she's talking to us with background noise in the back of their video. I just find that ironic. So you've just given me two extremes, the, the loud environment and the quiet environment. Can they still struggle in the in-between or in the grey areas? Absolutely. For some students, even a small amount of background noise can really interfere with their processing. It can be as subtle as an air conditioning unit or, or a fan in the background right. can be enough to affect the way that they're able to process what they're hearing. So, and that's registered as a distraction of sorts, is it, I, I would take it? Well, it just interferes with the processing of the speech signal so they're listening to the teacher speaking but any amount of other noise is going to impact on their ability to take in what the teacher's saying. Right. Um, just trying to understand all this is actually giving me somewhat of a headache. It seems quite complicated. Do the sufferers of this condition also suffer from physiological uh, responses like headaches and things like that? What What is the major sort of issue for particularly for students in a classroom with auditory processing disorder what they have to do all day every day is work really hard to keep listening right. they've got yeah. to put in so much energy just to keep listening so that at the end of the school day they are absolutely exhausted mm. so 
then you're asking them to then perhaps do homework after they've sat through a school day. So I use the analogy of asking them to energy into just listening over the background noises and the ability to process that, that you're just physically exhausted beyond all comprehension. So I'm going to fast forward this a little bit just to a certain point. And then we're going to play it from there for one more minute. aspects of communication particularly tone of voice and so if you've got a particular aspect of auditory processing disorder where you don't get that if i change my tone of voice i'm actually changing the meaning mm. that is hugely um difficult in social situations so these are the children that don't get jokes they don't get when their friends are being sarcastic. They can take things very literally. They can misinterpret the intention of what's being said. And so they are very easily insulted. Right, yeah. And so these are the kids that have a lot of social difficulty with communication because their auditory processing disorder is impacting on their ability to interpret the meaning or the intent of um, what's said. So for example, if I say to a student, gee, that was smart, or I say, that was smart, right, I've used yes. exactly and the same that, words, but my, my second one is being yeah. sarcastic. Here's yes. fine. Your hearing is just fine. The signal reaches where it is. It's just somewhere in that auditory processing center. You can't make sense of a difference in pitch and meaning the difference between sarcasm and actual compliment. So um, the next region we're going to get into is called the Wernicke's area. The Wernicke's area is also called the language comprehension written and spoken area, and it also involves mathematics. It's typically almost always located on the left posterior temporal lobe. But here's what I found is the fact that sometimes the Wernicke's area can be right, located on the right side of the brain. But in most instances, it actually is on the left. But we're going to assume that everybody in the class, their Wernicke's area is looking on the left. So all practical purposes on a quiz or a test, know that the Wernicke's area, area is on the left posterior temporal lobe. So if we look at this picture right here, here's your temporal lobe in green. You have this shaded area right here, which is going to be the Wernicke's area. I want you to take note that this is going to be the auditory area. And this is also the auditory association area reason I have the Broca's area highlighted here also is because these two communicate directly with each other for language comprehension um, and speech and understanding. And the third, the green shaded area, is actually going to come into play as the auditory cortex. It actually plays a third role in that. So basically, the Wernicke's area works in collaboration with the Broca's area, the auditory cortex, for full, full, the full spectrum of speech and language. You have to really think about it. You have to listen to speech. You visually take it in. You notice pitch changes. You notice volume changes. And then all of that has to come in. You have to know what certain words mean. Imagine being a toddler or imagine having the processing ability of a toddler, my two-year-old right now. If I said photosynthesis to him, he's not going to have a, even an idea of what that means on top of the ability to repeat that word because he's still developing the Broca's, the auditory cortex, auditory association area, and the Wernicke's area, Wernicke's area of his brain. Okay. Um, I do like this visual right here. So it kind of throws in, you have the motor cortex, you have the Broca's area, you have the auditory cortex, you have the Wernicke's area, and you have also what's called the angular gyrus. We're not going to really get into that. But what you have to understand is these pathways here work collaboratively between these two groups. But you have to think of it again as language as a whole. So when someone speaks to you, that, that sound waves come in, they're absorbed by the ear. They're changed from a mechanical, from a sound wave to a mechanical wave, which travels through the vestibulocochlear nerve of the auditory cortex to the Wernicke's area, where it then travels to the Broca's area, where in order to respond to speech, the Broca's area then sends a signal to the primary motor cortex to then send the signal to the muscles of the face, lips, mouth, tongue, throat, pharynx, lungs, all of those things in order to actually form speech. 
The next thing I wanted to talk to you about then is a disorder of the Wernicke's area. It's called Wernicke's aphasia. This one also blows me away. You remember earlier in the last video, or one of the last videos, I talked to you about Broca's aphasia. Broca's aphasia is when the person understands what's being said to them. They know which words can be used to answer a question, but they cannot form coherent words. This was the Tono Tono guy. In the Wernicke's aphasia, language comprehension is inhibited. So you might know what words are, you might be able to say them, but when someone actually asks you a question, those words come in, you know it was a question, but you have no idea what it actually means. So then what this results in is words and sentences are not clearly understood, and then actually sentence formation is inhibited, inhibited or completely nonsensical. Here's an example for you. Hi, Byron. How are you? I'm happy. Are you pretty? You look good. What are you doing today? We stayed with the water over here at the moment and talked with the people up at them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. But they'll save in the moment. He'll have water very soon for him. With luck for him. So we're on a cruise and we're about to we get to We will June. sort it right here and they'll save their hands right there for and, them. And what were we just doing with the iPad? Uh, right at the moment, they don't show a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> the iPad that we were doing. We, from, like, here? I'd like my change for me and change hands for me. It would happen. I would talk with Donna sometimes. We're out with them. Other people are working with them with them. I'm very happy with them. Good. This girl was fairly good and happy. I mean, I played golf and hit other trees. We play out with the hands. We save a lot of hands on hold for peoples, for us, other hands. I don't know what you get, but I talk with a lot of hand for him. Sometime, am I talk of any more to say in? All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, I appreciate it, and I hope the world lasts for you. So as thank you, you can it's see, been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Have a good day. The inability to understand the speech of somebody else but still be able to form words. Just simply do, that, was, that one's actually called fluent aphasia. There's a couple different versions of Wernicke's aphasia, but that particular one there, sentences mean nothing. Um, I, be, I would almost believe that he can hear for specific triggered, triggered sayings like thank you very much, and he replies with thank you very much, simply based on a reaction, not necessarily understanding what has to be, what is being said to him. Um, the next cortex we're going to go over is called the primary olfactory cortex. The primary olfactory cortex is associated with the sense of smell. So once your olfactory bulbs receive all the signals from the neurons of the nose, they're actually going to be sent through the nerve pathway, which is not visible on the superficial cortex. And it's look, um, the nerve pathway is not visible, except for you have the olfactory bulbs where they then extend down into the brain. But you have the primary olfactory cortex, which is located on each side of the brain, where it's located on the deep side of the anterior portion of the temporal lobe and just below the lateral sulcus. So here, they've got it separated here, but the lateral sulcus would run in this area right here, but they've got it pulled apart. So what you're looking at is the gustatory cortex is in the deep portion, deep superior portion of the temporal lobe. It kind of almost runs into the insula. And I did want to show you this picture because I just find this unbelievable. You have the, the neurons right here which run into the olfactory bulbs which then run into the brain and run themselves to the actual olfactory cortex. Alright, so that's where we're going to stop. Um, again, I just want to thank you guys very much for everything that you do. And I hope you found this as useful as um, it can possibly be. Best of luck to you.